Welcome to our webinar, and this is the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for the School of Nursing uh, on this panel discussion, and we're so glad that you were able to join us. And we'll start our webinar off by having comments. Uh, welcome from our Dean, Dean Musil. Good afternoon, and welcome to our annual Martin Luther King celebration. We celebrate Black History Month every year with a special event presented by the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing here at Case Western Reserve University. I'm Carol Musil, Dean of Nursing at FPB. This year, we gather virtually and we'll miss the usual song and meal that we share. But together, we will examine an important topic, equity, the issue of fairness and justice and opportunity as it relates to neighborhoods and healthcare. In a fair and equitable society, all people would have the same access to the same services and opportunities. But we know that isn't the case here in the United States. From a health perspective, in the last 18 months, the COVID-19 pandemic has illuminated the stark disparities in healthcare for people of color, the elderly, the poor, and those in rural communities. The video we're about to watch focuses on the topic of redlining. It illustrates how a racist federal policy from 1934 has negatively affected generations of minorities for the last 90 years. After the video, our panelists will speak to the effects of redlining, racism, and discriminatory policies and practices on their areas of expertise, communities, health, and healthcare. Thank you for joining the School of Nursing for this important conversation. Again, my name is Dedra Hannah Adams. I'm chair for the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for the School of Nursing. And we have other members of my committee on this webinar as well. My co-chair, Lorraine Joukowsky, uh, and another member of our committee, Jana Kinney. Uh, today, our format will be, we're gonna watch the video. And each panelist will be given an opportunity to talk for about 10 minutes. And after each panelist, uh, speaks, we'll have a Q&A. We're going to introduce each panelist right before they uh, begin their talk. We think this is going to present some robust discussion. And now we'll watch the video. Please welcome our first panelist, Melissa Klein. Dr. Klein is the Senior Vice President of Patient Care Services and the Chief Nursing Officer of the Metro Health System. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today and I'm very honored that um, I was asked to speak here today. Um, you know, as I watched the video, I was really struck by um, how the redlining really um, set the stage for everything that we are experiencing today with um, communities and health. Um, I'll be honest, I, I was kind of ignorant to this before this year. I've been participating in Leadership Cleveland, Cleveland this year, and it's very eye-opening. We've had a lot of discussion around this and the social determinants of health. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the social determinants of health and um, what it looks like in Cuyahoga County, and then talk about some of the, um, what I think are unique things that Metro Health is doing to help um, bring equity and justice um, um, to this issue. So next slide, please. So as you heard in the video, um, the redlining really set off this spiral of um, issues within our Black and people of color, their communities. And it started by simply drawing that red line and putting some barriers in place, a system in place to prevent um, Black families from accu the accumulating wealth. Um, I don't know if anybody first saw this, but um, you know, 40, 50 years later, um, we look at these factors as social determinants of health. And these are the forces and in systems, including economic policies and systems, development agendas, social agendas, social norms, social policies, and political systems that have an important influence on health inequities the unfair and avoidable differences in health status within and between groups. Examples um, of social determinants of health are um, income, education, food insecurity, 
housing and basic amenities, discrimination, and access to affordable quality health services. Research shows that up to 80% of a person's health depends on factors beyond a hospital or a healthcare system walls. Um, and these factors are all of the problems and issues created by that redlining um, legislation and, and rules created back in the 30s. So by addressing social determinants of health, um, we can help reduce longstanding inequities in health, um, but it takes everybody to participate in this. So next slide, please. Um, back in 2019, several groups came together um, to do a Cuyahoga County Community Health Assessment. Um, this was known as Health Improvement Partnership Cuyahoga. And as you look at this, um, one of the number one um, opportunities that they identified for our community was structural racism, trust, poverty, food insecurity, and transportation. These all contributed to the poor health of our community and leads to shorter lives. Um, and that's determined by infant mortality, life expectancy, and mortality rates from disease. Next slide. You can see that especially right here in the city of Cleveland, we have a higher rate of individuals living below the poverty level um, and a higher um, proportion of Black and Hispanics living below the poverty level than, than our um, white counterparts. So this is very much alive in Cleveland and we are seeing the effects of that. Next slide. I wanted to um, just go over and explain a, a few terms that I'll be honest, I didn't um, really have a clear understanding of either until a couple years ago. As you can see uh, in the picture of equality, you're treating everybody equally. Everybody gets that same um, step up to help them see over that fence. But is that really working for everybody? It's equal treatment, but it's not really um, providing the shorter person the ability to see above the fence. So with equity, what you want to um, look at is dividing um, and providing different supports um, to people so that they can have equal access. So some people might need a little bit more support than others. Justice is really looking at removing the barriers in the systems that created the um, the, the barriers to begin with. So in that last picture, um, instead of um, providing different supports to people, they actually removed that wood fence so that everybody could see. Next slide, please. So here at Metro Health, we've really been working on our equity um, um, aspects of care um, in the hopes to bring about justice. So one of the things that we established over the past year was our Institute for Hope. And Hope stands for Improved Health Through Opportunity, Partnership, and Empowerment. This past year, we screened over 32,000 people for social determinants of health. And we found that over 30% have at least two or more social determinant of health needs. We've worked with Unite Ohio to connect people to resources and to develop collaborative partnerships within the community um, some of the things that we've addressed are social isolation and food insecurity during the pandemic and um, the stay at home orders. We've looked at digital inclusion, so breaking down barriers and providing help and support to those that don't have access to Wi Fi, internet, and computers. And we've done a program with CMHA at the Scranton Castle where we provided access devices, training, and support. And then I mentioned the food insecurity during the pandemic. One of the things we noticed that um, as people were forced to stay at home or didn't have um, access to their jobs because of the stay at home order, they were having problems with their medication. So we worked on getting medications out to our patients, but what we noticed also was that they didn't have access to food. If there's a stay at home order or you're missing your income because you're not able to work, um, more families were at risk or experiencing food insecurity. So along with our medication deliveries, um, we delivered food also. 
to those in need. Next slide, please. Um, also, with the pandemic um, disparities, we have looked as we've gotten our vaccine to make sure that we are meeting people where they're at. A really interesting story this week um, that also demonstrates, um, I think, the difference between equality and equity is um, there was a story of a patient um, at a um, different health system than Metro Health who wanted to get the vaccine. She qualified for it. And they made her an appointment, but she lived on the east side of Cleveland and her appointment that they gave her was on the west side. She didn't drive. She met the criteria of who we're giving the vaccine to um, today. So she was, I believe in her seventies. Um, and in order to get over to the west side, um, she would have had to take three buses. Her appointment was at the beginning of the week with um, a snow, snowstorm occurring. So who knew if the buses were going to be um, on time. So while some people would say, well, we were treating people equally, she got access to get a vaccine just like everybody else. Um, was that really equity though? We put a lot of barriers in place for her to be able to get that. Um, and ultimately she wasn't able to, to make that appointment. Um, we were able to step in and get her hooked up with a uh, location that was much easier for her to get to. Um, and so one of the things that we've done is we've been looking um, at distributing the, the COVID vaccine is ensuring that we are getting to um, our patients um, in areas that might not have the ability to access main campus or to go to um, a, a, a clinic on the west side. So we have been, um, very careful and diligent in our planning of where we're offering our COVID vaccine clinics. We've also measured um, the um, distribution of the vaccine amongst our white patients and our black patients. Um, and right now we're, we're sitting at 26% um, of eligible white patients have received the vaccine and 25% of black patients have receive the vaccine. So we're continuing to monitor that and look at how can we continue to increase that um, vaccine acceptance rate within the Black community. So we've wor worked with multiple partners, the um, leaders of some of the faith communities um, here in the city and the county to help get that education, information, and access out to our Black patients. And then we've continued to do some focus group and interviews with patients of color to identify and eliminate barriers for them to get the vaccine. Next slide, please. Um, one of the programs I'm most proud of because it's led by nurses is our nurse family partnership. So um, we became aware of this program when we started talking about the infant mortality rates here in um, Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. So in the US, black babies, before they reach the age of one, die at twice the rate of white babies. Um, that rate is three times higher in the state of Ohio. And in Cuyahoga County, black babies die at a rate four times higher than white babies. And in the city of Cleveland alone, that number is nearly six times higher. So the Nurse Family Partnership Program is an evidence-based program with the goals of improving pregnancy outcomes by helping women engage in good preventative health practices improving um, child health and development by helping patients provide responsible and competent care and improving the economic self-sufficiency of the family by helping parents develop a vision for the future. And this is led by nurses. So how this program works is um, a mother presents and it's her first um, pregnancy or first baby that she's gonna have. And we um, introduce her to a nurse in our family partnership. And this is a bachelor's prepared nurse with an OB background. And they follow the patient um, through their um, antepartum phase, through the uh, first year of, of the child's life. And we've had some excellent outcomes with that. Overall, NFP programs are in other cities, other states. And um, they've had some great outcomes too, but I wanted to share with you some of our specific ones. So next slide, please. Right now we have 390 clients enrolled, but we've served um, over 950. 
we've had 529 babies born. And in the couple years that we've had this program in place, we've had zero infant mortality, which is amazing. Um, we've also had some other great outcomes, a 40% decrease in smoking status, 85% of mothers um, start off breastfeeding, 33% are still breastfeeding at six months and 12% at 12 months. We have 90% compliance with childhood immunization at 18 months and 86% at 24 months. And as you can see from our client demographics, 66% um, of our um, clients are African-American. Um, the age ranges, um, but the majority are between 15 and 29. And 51% um, of our clients have um, what I would describe as a very low income, less than $6,000 annually. So we've seen some excellent um, outcomes from this. Um, on the previous slide, um, I provided a link um, to what's called the Antidote movie. Um, and if, if you check that out and uh, scroll down to the bottom of that homepage, click on Cleveland and you'll be able to see um, one of our nurse family partner supervisors, Maria, um, talk about the program and her experience with it and um, also um, some discussion with some clients to, to hear about um, how they benefited from the program. Um, next slide, next slide. And then kind of beyond just traditional healthcare, one of the things that Metro Health has gotten involved in is um, more the community development aspect. And we really looked at education as a means for um, helping to uh, break down the barriers in um, this system that's in place. So we've partnered with two schools. Uh, one is St. Martin de Porres High School and one is Lincoln West. So St. Martin's is an awesome school. It's on, um, I would say the near east side of Cleveland and they offer college prep courses and a college work study program. So how Metro Health got involved in it is that we support six job teams. So each job team is four students um, and they come here one to two days a week and work in one of our departments. So depending on what they're interested in, they, we have them everywhere from nursing um, to our legal department to HR and they get some real life um, job training, um, mentorship, and then um, the dollars that we pay um, for the work study go directly to support their tuition at school. The school offers college prep courses. Um, they have almost a 100% accept, uh, acceptance rate to college, and they are continuing to follow their students into the college years um, and provide support and programs to them after they graduate from high school. Lincoln West um, School of Science and Health um, is a, a Cleveland Public School that's um, on West One or West 30th Street, real close here to Metro. But what we did a couple of years ago was we opened up a campus here right at Metro Health. So the students come here um, various number of days each week, and they're students that are interested in health and science. Um, they get their courses here. Um, we see them every day here on our Metro Health campus. Um, and we provide subject matter experts um, in their classes and we have a mentoring program with them. Um, and then they also do some uh, precepting or a practicum with us depending on the area they're interested in. So we've hosted students in nursing um, and various departments throughout the hospital so that students get a exposure to um, the healthcare field. So those are some of the things that um, Metro Health is um, doing to help improve the social determinants of health. And I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Klein. Our next speaker um, is Adrian Fletcher. Dr. Fletcher is an assistant professor and the assistant dean of diversity inclusion at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences at Case Western Reserve University. Thank you, Jana. Jana, is it okay if I share my screen? I think I have capacity, so. Yes, please do. Perfect, okay. I'm gonna move back. As you see, I embedded that wonderful video um, into our conversation, but we're not gonna use it. We're just gonna press forward. And thank you, um, Melissa, for providing such a, um, a broad, um, broad content on what 
redlining has done in our communities. So some of the information and content that I share will be redundant, some of it will not, but I think it just really reinforces the damage that redlining has done, not only in the Cleveland area, but literally across the country. Um, and it's had a uh, strong impact in Northern cities. And so I'd like to start off by sharing that um, housing segregation was an intentional part of federal policy. So it is embedded, it was embedded in the policy policies from the United States government, who as the video demonstrated in Adam shows, um, Adam ruins everything, policies specifically stated that people of color, specifically black or African-American individuals were not allowed to live in certain communities. So our housing policies were terribly discriminatory. Redlining simply became a tool to continue this, these federally socially engineered housing segregation. So many of the communities that we live in right now in 2021 were socially engineered by our federal government. And so I would like um, everyone on the call, all of the participants, including the panelists, to think for just a moment about the community that they live in. And I would like for you all to think for just a moment about how racially diverse or not the community that you live in is at this very moment. We continue to see remnants of the past, vestiges of the past, specifically surrounding these federally socially engineered communities that we live in. So redlining is simply a tool that continues that work. What, what is redlining? And, and Adam really spelled it out for us, but I'm just gonna share a few more of um, the details. Redlining actually is systemic racism based on group or ethnicity. And as you can see, I've crossed out the word race because we all know that race is a social construction, that it actually does not exist in our biology. And you all are particularly aware of that because you are nurses, you are involved in medicine. So race does not exist in our biology. Redlining is in fact racism based on group or ethnicity. Redlining manifests itself in several discriminatory, discriminatory practices, particularly now. It manifests itself by placing financial services out of reach for certain groups of people, right? It manifests itself by placing uh, real estate services out of reach for certain groups. It also manifests itself by the systemic um, denial of mortgages, insurance, loans, and these are based on the location that one might seek to move into and versus the qualifications or credit worthiness of the individual, right? So as a woman of color, I may have um, all of the qualifications necessary to buy a home in a certain community, but I may be offered what is called a predatory loan or a loan that is at a higher rate, right? Which is simply a, um, an offshoot I guess we could say of redlining because it continues to reinforce the siloed or uh, racially or group um, segregated communities. Redlining is in fact experienced primarily by residents of minoritized neighborhoods, residents who live in minoritized neighborhoods. We've already seen Adam, Adam ruins everything. I just want to share some demographics specifically from the East Cleveland um, area. Um, Cleveland's demographics are similar, but I had these demographics available. So as we think about um, specific communities surrounding Western Reserve University, what we recognize is that East Cleveland is 91% African American or Black. However, in East Cleveland, owner-occupied homes or homes that have been purchased, right? Individuals who actually have a mortgage only rises to the percentage of 34%, right? And the, the average income of, or the average cost of the house, I'm sorry, is $57,000. $57, and um, to go along with the impact, the continued impact of redlining, 
Only 51% of the folks who live in this particular city have internet available to them or can purchase internet. 82% of the folks have a diploma. 12% of the folks who live in East Cleveland have a bachelor's degree. The median household income in this particular city is $21,000, and the number of persons in poverty rises to a whopping 38%. And what we recognize with each one of these uh, demographics is that this is not necessarily about individual responsibility and individual um, uh, shall I just say, one's ability to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. This is about something broader and something larger. This is partially due to the continued impact of redlining. Here are some other demographics that I'd like to share with you, which are simply um, a, continued, a continued result of redlining. What we recognize is that there are several sources of trauma in areas where the poverty level is terribly high and in areas where there is less home ownership. So what we notice is that there is a wealth gap. We saw that 38% of the folks in East Cleveland were living in poverty. There's also the experience of lack of employment or underemployment. And that's one of the things that uh, Melanie mentioned earlier. Um, housing discrimination, as we can see by the number of individuals in East Cleveland who actually own their own homes. We also know that infant and maternal mortality are high in a city like East Cleveland. And I'm sure Bernie is going to share some more demographics about maternal and infant mortality shortly. We also know that in these cities, a city like East Cleveland and Cleveland also, there is increased government surveillance in cities where there is redlining. Right. And, and the, the other piece that I want to bring in is that several workers who go into these communities, um, including social workers like, like myself, are often very well intentioned, but without the expanded knowledge of the implications of redlining, um, we often lean into individual responsibility when we think of some of the, um, some of the negative implications that families are experiencing. There are other sources of trauma in communities that have been redlined. There is an increased incident of domestic violence or intimate partner violence. There's also oftentimes an increased incident of physical and emotional and sexual abuse. Oftentimes families and children in these areas experience greater abandonment and loss. And part of this has to do with um, lack of employment or underemployment. Right. We also think of a medical trauma as an experience that individuals in redlined areas experience. We know that um, there's often a decreased access to adequate health care. And we know that many folks do, in fact, use the emergency room as a means of caring for themselves in during times of physical need. There's also an in increase in um, prostitution, and I mentioned surveillance earlier. There's also an increase in traffic stops and pat downs and all of these things really encompass this notion of trauma. And trauma is a will, uh, uh, a perceived or real experience of um, emotional or physical distress. And I would assert to you today that redlining is a source of systemic trauma, particularly in our neighborhoods of color. So as individuals who um, are professionals and who may find ourselves engaging with folks who live in these communities that have been redlined, it would behoove us to become aware of the history of the community and also increase our awareness of our own trauma, of our own, I'm sorry, of our own biases so that we do not put forth any further trauma um, on the families and individuals that we might be working with. And I'm going to unshare. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Fletcher. Um, our next panelist is Bernadette Kerrigan. She is the executive director for First Year Cleveland with the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. Thanks so much for having First Year Cleveland here today and we applaud the nursing school for um, leading such an important topic today. 
you may not know your first year Cleveland is actually housed at Case Western Reserve School of Medicine in the nursing school and many other departments throughout Case um, are part of first year Cleveland, which is um, to be applauded on there. What is First Year Cleveland? We came together in our community in December 30th, 2015, um, noting for six decades high infant mortality rate, and we wanted to develop a new way to address this very old problem. Next slide. What is critical here and what we want you to begin thinking through is the data was very clear to us. And I'm gonna show a quick video and then leave ample time for the next panelist and we can talk more about it when we get into question and answers. But we have worked before first year Cleveland on changing the behavior of the expected parent and the parent. But the data was very clear that is not the behavior of the expected parent and parent we need to change, it's our behavior. It's the behavior of myself as a social worker who's a proud alumni um, to MSAS. It is you as um, coming to, as nurses, doctors, engineers, social workers, teachers, um, parents. There is something about our community that we wanted to spend six decades um, changing behaviors of um, individuals that their behaviors overall are not the problem. It is how we serve them and the embedded structural racism policies that we continue to um, activate that is the reason our community has high infant mortality rate. Next slide, please. So I am going to show a video. I want you to really think out what did it mean for our community when I was hired in this amazing position that it was supposedly about prenatal care. We must have more black families that are um, alcohol and drug use during their pregnancy. We must have more black teens that are losing their babies. And when you look at this video, how many of those same assumptions did you have which are all false, false, and we really came to the root um, conclusion um, that is now pretty much um, valid throughout um, the rest of the country who's now kind of going under our direction of where to address the issue and how to improve infant mortality. So I want you to step back and think more what your role, not the expected parent or the new parent, not your patient, what, what role they're playing, but I want you to think about what role you may be playing um, that you're not even aware of um, that could save a baby's life and a mom's life. Video, please. Thank you. Due to time, if you wouldn't mind putting it to my last slide, I wanna be very clear that um, professionals, white professionals like myself have been a key reason for this problem, but there is no reason we can't be the key reason for this solution. I can't be more proud that when I was hired at Case Western Reserve, on my first day, I was asked to take a bias test and one of the sections was racial biases. And I had to go home and talk to my two beautiful adopted girls of color um, about my own biases. I think it's really important where here it talks about um, an employee or workplace to do this, but I think it's important for all of us as students, continuous learners. I really am pushing hard for the state to um, know um, students should graduate from high school without knowing their biases and knowing how to mitigate those biases. I think the same for universities. I think the same in the workplace. This is an ongoing journey, 402 years. This is embedded. Um, and the way we know that for a fact is um, you'll see when you're sent the earlier slides that we talk to patients um, being served in our great quality um, health care. And they are, they've been key to First Year Cleveland. They're actually chairing much of our work. But we found the experience of a Black and Hispanic family is very different than a white family. We all have biases. We all are hearing things different when they're said by a Black person versus a white person versus a Hispanic. There's no, it's, there's no more time to debate it. It's factual. It's it is, but what it means, especially for us white professionals, is we have to almost retrain the way we hear things, the way we see things, and if we don't, 
we are going to continue to have classrooms, uh, babies of color dying that is preventable. There's a beautiful film called Toxic. Um, that if you get a chance when you get this, um, feel free to look it up. But it is um, multiple African-American families came together that had lost a baby to share their experience. And these were upper middle class um, um, professionals that have lost this baby. We are not losing babies due to poverty. We are losing babies to structural racism. I'll stop there and pass it on to the next speaker and honor to answer any questions during that session. Thank you, Bernadette. Um, we have one more panelist before we open up for our question and answers. Um, Dr. Sonia Moore is an assistant professor and director of the nurse anesthesia program at the School of Nursing at Case West Reserve. Sonia. Well, thank you everyone for uh, having me here and um, I'll wait on Liz to kind of get my slides up there or if she needs me to share my screen, I can. So the group asked me to kind of talk about how to retain and recruit uh, underrepresented groups and what the redlining impact has had on those. And so uh, we'll see and hear a lot of redundant information, which is really interesting how uh, we can talk about all of these separate topics, but they all weave back to the same source and the same cause. Next slide. So again, government policies. Here is our area in Northeast and Eastern Ohio, and we can see kind of the areas in our community that have historically been redlined. And so when we think about redlining, I, you know, I like this uh, political comic because it gives us a good example of the barriers that African Americans and minorities face as they try to traverse the educational pathway, the workforce, and et cetera. And as you can see, things like redlining, subprime mortgages, and uh, the wealth gap, and poor schools kind of impact uh, the route that most African Americans and minorities take. Next slide. So again, the government intentionally uh, put policies in place all the way back to the, uh, the New Deal that kind of impacted these communities and how we grew, how we grew as a community and moved forward. forward. Part of that was the di di disinvestment of housing, housing declines and predatory lending, which led to foreclosures of houses. And even those um, areas um, where we had uh, the predatory lending or the uh, loan practice where you had those that were living in non-redlined areas had decent uh, interest rates and mortgage rates and those living in the redlined areas had almost a two to three percent increase in their mortgage rates. Even in those areas, the folks in the non-redlined areas, when people could not afford the rents that they were charging within the red line areas, they allowed those houses to be neglected and get in disrepair, which allowed many different aspects of security and crime to impact the environment. Again, those things played a role into the generational wealth loss of those in those communities because real estate is the prime way in which we move our wealth forward as we saw in the video so that our students can go to school, so that uh, they can resell or rehab those homes, build a better home and continue that generational wealth as individuals move forward. And so with those neglected homes in those red line areas, we also found that they were highly polluted areas as well as industry uh, grew right up against the fence of those communities. So it impacted the health of the children in those areas with asthma and lead poisoning. And when uh, these communities had no access to health care, so they had increased sickness, they didn't have the resources of preventative care. And so that just perpetuated that system as we moved forward. The other thing that occurred, and we witnessed it here in our area, right up the street from Case Western Reserve, if you drive right up Fairmount, 
<clears throat> you see where we have our million dollar row, if you will. So you have these houses that were built that were right outside of some of the red line areas, but all of the safety patrols and things went for those areas, as opposed to those inner city areas where the housing density was so high. So, so how does all of that impact someone going through kindergarten through the 12th grade? So redlining's impact on K through 12, we've already heard about the property taxes in the video. And I think Dr. Fletcher spoke about the property taxes as well. If you live in a non-redlined area, you know, your property taxes supported your schools at a much greater rate than it does if you're in a redlined area. And because you don't get that uh, economics into your school system, your teachers are un un underpaid, uh, the technology and equipment are less, and we've seen that so much in this COVID with the school, the students being taught at home. Some areas have lack of Wi-Fi or no Wi-Fi, and then some schools have the ability to supply their students with the technology needed, Chromebooks, et cetera, whereas those communities in those redlined areas don't have that. And then uh, Dr. Fletcher talked about the ad adverse childhood experiences or those traumas that kind of build into one's life that kind of follow you as you move forward. Then health inequities, again, the asthma and the lead poisoning that those communities experience. But one of the greater things that uh, redlining has done because of the increased poverty inside those communities, absenteeism, at the K through 12 level is really high. <clears throat> and it's high because for various reasons. One reason may be mom or dad works two or three jobs to support the family, even though they're still living under the poverty level at that point, that older child have to, has to take care of the younger children. So that child then becomes absent more frequently in schools. Guidance counselors play a role because what they tend to do is they tend to try and meet the students where they are, but they don't look at where their future is going to be. They don't try to move them out of the system. You know, guidance counselors will often steer students toward a trade craft or something like that, as opposed to having them go off to a four-year college. And then philanthropy, one of the greatest examples of that well-intentioned, but not really Hitting the mark is uh, the latest example, or one of the biggest examples recently, is Bill and Melinda Gates when they uh, try to restructure public schools and high schools by actually breaking up each of these high schools into academies. And students didn't really have a lot of choice of which academy they ended up in. So if you ended up in an academy that was for trade or for example, cosmetology, but you wanted to go on to a STEM program such as engineering or nursing, you didn't have the pedigree when you finished high school to do so. And then when those programs proved to be somewhat unsuccessful, uh, the philanthropists kind of leave the environment but leave the cost behind. And these are already schools that don't have the economics to support such programs like that. So higher education. So again, there's a lot of things surrounding higher education that we wonder, you know, why at a two to one rate, we lose our minority students, uh, why they don't go to four year programs. And there's a lot of dynamics that play into that. And so a couple of the things I wanted to talk about are listed here. For example, student loans, it's almost very similar to the predatory housing market that's out there. So if you live in a African-American or minority community or a community that's been redlined, you're apt to have to pay a higher student loan percentage or your risk or your credit worthiness is such that you end up with a higher rate. And if you do decide that it's more economic for you to go to a community college versus a standard four-year college, the same thing applies. Those interest rates that you have to pay for on those student, lo student loans are much higher than they are if you went to a standard college. 
And HBCUs, I think, are a great thing. You know, they provide an environment for students to be included and involved with students that look like them, have faculty that look like them, be mentored by people that look like them. And we know that those are things that help people thrive and grow. But one of the things that I think we, none of us really know is that the foundation of the HBCUs and kind of where they began and how that's kind of perpetuated this redlining system. So Spelman and Morehouse, who were created by the Rockefellers, were created at the same time as the University of Chicago, which the Rockefellers created as well. The HBCUs were designed to be trade or technical schools, if you will, while the University of Chicago was designed for the white male to be managers and senior executives. So even when the well-intentioned are doing a good thing, they put that disparity there and it holds those communities back from further growth. And then standardized entrance exams. I had a conversation with one colleague that said, no, we definitely have to go by the numbers because math is math. And I said, well, not necessarily. Math isn't math. I said, if you go to a high school that don't have AP courses or don't have geometry or calculus in your school, but then you go on to take a standardized test that have those items on it, your score is not going to be high as those who have those courses in their high schools. And so again, standardized entrance exams aren't really standardized. They're standardized for a certain segment of the community. So currently we see a lot of schools and universities are looking at those exams and saying that we're not getting a true picture of all of our applicants and all of our candidates. And so they're sort of starting to move away from some of those numbers that we thought predicted what a graduate student or graduating student would look like. And then again, talking about the college preparation curriculum, college prep courses. A lot of the schools in uh, the redlined areas, East Cleveland per, per se, like Dr. Fletcher was talking about East Cleveland earlier, there is a very limited or non-existent college preparatory curriculum. And so the expectation that those students are going to go on and be able to enter college, be successful and be rate, retained is very limited. And uh, one of the stories I often tell students uh, is one of the experiences I had because I grew up in East Cleveland. And one of the experience I had is when I left Cleveland and went down to the University of Cincinnati and I'm in my first year biology course and I'm telling you, when I say it felt like the professor was speaking a foreign language to me, he really was. But that didn't bother me as much as the two young white gentlemen who were sitting next to me were laughing and having a good time in class. And me being young, you know, and I said, okay, I'm going to have this conversation said, hey, I need to understand what he's talking about. How dare you interrupt his class like this? How can you? And their response to me was, oh, we had the same textbook in high school. This is our second time going through it. So just that disparity in where I came from and where they came from and where we are at where we were as freshmen in college really opened my eyes to the work that I needed to do and where I had been held back. Because that's the other thing that we don't know or understand is that when these students leave these communities, they are A students, they are good students. They don't know that they haven't been exposed to uh, the level of curriculum that will make them successful in the future. Needless to say, I made those two my best friend and we got through biology together. So what are some solutions? How can we fix this? How can we make it better? And I think part of the answer is a lot of what we talked about already is being intentional about what we're doing and not letting stereotypes or false information, you know, cloud our judgment about people, cloud our judgment about how we care for people when we're in the hospital setting, recognizing that people come from 
a place where they want to be educated. They want the best health care. They want to have what they need to take care of their families. And I think if we treat everyone with those thoughts in mind and, and setting the stereotypes aside, we can't accomplish some of these solutions. Next slide. So what are some of those solutions? You know, one of the, um, the biggest thing, we need policy changes. We need government legislation to be passed that will help and allow students to have the opportunity and be placed on a, a level playing field. Need-based scholarships. You know, one of the things that really excited me was when Case Western Reserve decided to go to, to need-based scholarships, because then that said that those people who uh, could fit in our community at Case Western Reserve but couldn't afford to be in our community would now have the opportunity to do so. The other thing we need to think about and look at is our mission requirements. Again, with the standardized testing, how are we deciding who are the best applicants for our programs? Are we looking at them from a stereotypical metric that has always been in place? Or are we looking at them from a metric of who they are, what their experiences have given them and moved them forward? into uh, success in their futures. Create programs to increase preparedness. Uh, you know, we have the Provo Scholars that Dr. Faye Gary runs that meets those students as uh, high school students and provide them the necessary tools to be successful as they move forward. We have several summer pre-enrollment programs. A lot of university have those in the STEM fields, uh, but opening those up to longer than just a summer, just having the student for one summer, you know, opening those up so that we can set up a pattern and so students can see how they can be successful in programs. And then post baccalaureate programs, like we have the prime program with the medical school and we're creating our own post baccalaureate program in nurse anesthesia, hopefully to start this summer. The problem with those programs is twofold. One, they add an added expense onto students, okay? So we're saying now that because you weren't prepared well, you have to now pay more for an education. So we need to try really hard to help subsidize those programs as well. The other is a lot of those programs have students go through the program, get certificates, um, and be successful in those programs, but then they still have to go through the systemic biases to get into the primary program that they wanted to get into in the first place. And that's why our program is gonna be unique in that we formed this collaboration with several schools so that if they, are, they successfully complete our program, they'll have automatic admission into those programs if they choose to go. And then intentional community building. You know, I think Case is doing a magnificent job with their work that they are looking at East Cleveland and Cleveland because they are right in the middle of those communities and looking to build upon things like the Provo Scholars and move forward. Mentoring is a big part. Having people that look like you have attained some of the goals that uh, people that look like them have attained go a long way putting that hard work in, you know, not just spending time for the sake of spending time, but putting that heart in. And the literature just tells us that if we can recruit and retain diverse faculty, you know, that we can definitely potentially increase our recruitment and retainment of diverse students and, and support our offices of diversity, equity, and inclusion offer them to support. And when I say support those offices, that means the leadership of organizations, educational institutions have to support them and give them the latitude to make the changes and policies that need to be changed to make uh, the program successful. And so this is one of my favorite quotes, you know, uh, because opportunity is where it all begins. And if we're not all provided the same opportunity on a level playing field, we'll continue to have these disparities. And so I look for the solutions that Metro is incorporating, that Case Western Reserve University is incorporating, First Year Cleveland is incorporating, 
are those opportunities that will allow us to all be on equal footing. Thank you. Uh, we're going to open up the question and answer period right now. I like to, I've learned a lot, you know, uh, we're all lifetime learners, at least I hope we are. Uh, and definitely the conversations has been surrounded around our, the uh, theme for the MLK celebration, closing the divide, building communities of support, belonging togetherness. I think all of our uh, panelists have spoke to that. Um, and now I'll, we'll just open up for Q and A's. I guess just maybe going in order, there was a question from Doreen, um, and I believe she posed this question um, during Dr. Fletcher's presentation, um, asking if there are any rules or policies that still allow racism or colonization. Right, so yeah, let's, let's think about that. So first of all, we are still reeling from the vestiges of um, years and years of exclusionary practices. We have not, the ship has, has not been righted yet. Right, so we're still reeling from the federal housing practices and policies that were instated in 1935. So that is still very much in existence. And I will say that what we are experiencing now is more um, de facto, right? By experience versus de jure, by rule. So very much so these policies um, that are no longer on the books, have gone underground and they are implicit. We are still very much experiencing them. So they are de facto, not de jour. And I hope that answers your question. So we're still in the throes of predatory lending. We're still in the throes of um, individuals who can't um, live in certain neighborhoods because of the color of their skin. And these are all just vestiges of the past. Thank you. We have another question. Um from Kim Green for um, Dr. Klein. And she says, nurse family partnership is a great program for first time mothers and babies. Thank you very much for sharing. Are there plans for expansion of the program? Um, and is there like a graduation for families once they complete the program? And if they're given resources they needed to continue um, some of the skills and habits they've learned? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Kim. Um, Yes, so um, we do have a celebration when when they graduate. And I believe if you watch that uh, film that I hit the website for it, you'll see one of that. Um, the program is growing. So originally we started with um, one team. So a team is four nurses and a soup. We are at two teams. Um, so we have eight nurses, two supervisors, and we're on the verge of needing a third team. So um, we've been able to uh, work with community partners to get um, support for that um, to help fund the program. Um, and we're continuing to look for more support to add another team. We're also evaluating whether or not the um, that we could we expand to not just first time mothers, but maybe mothers. Um, that um, you have challenges, um, you have um, the risk factors for the infant mortality. Um, can we include those moms in this program also or, or do something very similar for them? And this is Bernie um, for Share Cleveland and Nurse Family Partnership is a phenomenal partner with us. We have for other um, home visiting or what we call perinatal birth working programs. So approximately one out of every four Medicaid expected parent is within a program. And we think that's invaluable, but as you know, expected and new parents are only in the medical system and within these home visiting programs, typically no more than two to three years. And their prenatal care and post care in and out of systems, very, quickly um, in the big scheme of life. And they're more in their neighborhoods, they're more in the workplace, they're more in um, libraries, gyms, everything else. And I think that's where we're trying to sort out that how do we address um, racism through so many systems 
because the healthcare system has made it mandatory for all their employees. Nurse Family Partnership staff has gone through racial bias testing and training. But um, until we get everybody understanding the history of our country and understanding how it's impacted our ability to serve, um, I think we're gonna continue to be white knuckling it until we get everyone on the same page. We have another question from um, Megan, who is a current FPB student, and this is for all the panelists. As students about to begin our professional careers, what are some ways we can challenge implicit bias and systemic racism in the workplace in addition um, to supporting administrative efforts to make a broader scale change? I'll go ahead and jump right in with one part of the question, if that's okay. So by nature, um, implicit bias means you're unaware of it, right? So, so, so the first step in the right direction is, is raising awareness. And, and Bernie shared her experience, right? Her lived experience of taking the IAT or the implicit association test and having this aha moment. And as a result of having an aha moment, you have the opportunity to then begin to do something different. Right? So raise awareness, take the IAT, take it more than once, right? So um, that, that's just one part of uh, the question and, and I'll stop because I'm sure other panelists wanna tackle other parts of the question. So I'll jump in. I think part of it as nurses and starting a career in nursing is not only understanding our own implicit bias, you know, like Dr. Fletcher was saying, but also understanding the culture of the individuals we're taking care of, right? So uh, going back to those terms that sort of get grayed all the time or get used interchangeably, like cultural competence or uh, cultural sensitivity and those things, in order for us to be culturally competent and take good care of our patients, we have to understand their culture, understand why their beliefs are what they are, understand why their religious preferences are what they are, and respect that. You know, we may not agree with it, but we have to respect where their cult cultures and their learned environment has placed them. And I think as uh, nurses, it's very important that we support our patients in that endeavor and then advocate for our patients when we see others are not uh, valuing their cultural perspectives. I would tack onto that also advocating for your colleagues um, when people are not ex, um, uh, treating them with equity or treating them with, with um, a cultural understanding um, and be a lifelong learner. Like I said, I, I admit, I did not know much about redlining before this year and it has been such an eye opener and I, am, I don't wanna use the word fascinated, but I'm just so interested in trying to figure out how we undo this. Um, something that was in, in place for 30, 40 years, and, and we're now 50, 60 years past it, and we're still seeing such ramifications from it. So I would say to continue to be a lifelong learner, advocate for your patients, and advocate for your coworkers. Yeah, the only last thing I would add is, I guess, for me personally, I will not work for an employer that doesn't take this serious. I mean, Case is taking it serious. They um, not only offer that test, um, I take it now on a more regular basis. They have afforded to support me in having a coach mentor, Dr. James, that can look at our policies, watch my blind side. So I guess be picky who you work for, be picky who you shop with, be picky on, on you know, really just start thinking through once you get awoken, um, what's gonna support you to stay awake and, um, and pick those because you're gonna have choices in your career and I strongly suggest you choose places that is taking um, this issue very serious and will support you on your personal and professional journey to continue this work. It's not like a one and done. It's not like I got certified in project management and now I get it, um, which did occur. I spent as much time on this daily as I do in honing some of my strategic skills. If I could just... Um... Uh, try to pull everything together um, regarding uh, policy analysis. 
So if, if you are working at an organization and you are very serious about implicit bias and explicit bias as drivers, look at the policies and seriously consider the language in each of the policies because oftentimes exclusionary practices are embedded in the policy and in the language. So look at the policies, be intentional and try to tease out those specific biases that will exclude certain people from receiving the care that they need. I was gonna raise a question from Kathleen. One of our participants said, for those of us who are retired and looking for ways to volunteer, is there an opportunity to volunteer in some of these programs? If so, please give an example. I would say um, here at Metro Health, uh, Institute for Health um, uses a lot of volunteers. We use volunteers to deliver the medications and to um, deliver food and have um, uh, the, um, the food access points for people to come and pick up food. So I, I definitely think there's opportunities. Get involved in some of your um, other community agencies, um, everything from the food bank to schools to um, neighborhood development um, groups. Um, there's, there's tons of ways to be involved. I echo that we have a lot of now churches, mosques, temples um, taking the toxic film and um, showing it and also then having a panel afterwards talking about it. So um, book clubs are now um, something that a lot of people are getting involved in. So I think diaper banks, um, clearly families still need emergency um, needs um, during all of this. There's an additional question for um, Dr. Fletcher. Um, Kim said, thank you for sharing the alarming statistics for East Cleveland. I grew up, went to school and lived in East Cleveland until I graduated from college 30 years ago. Can you share specific assistance or attention being offered to the city to improve their overall statistics? Right, so I guess I can start with the program that Dr. Faye Gary birthed, the Provo Scholars Program, which is specifically geared toward students in East Cleveland who are really the best and the brightest. So that is one initiative that is expanding beyond just engaging with the student and um, engaging now with uh, many of the uh, teachers and uh, support staff um, from the janitor who is exceedingly important all the way to the superintendent. So um, just last week we had the opportunity, or it was earlier this week, I'm sorry, this week has been a blur, everybody. We had the opportunity to, to engage with um, about 185 people and think out loud about COVID-19, its impact on that community and the potential of taking the vaccine. So um, as this relationship develops and expands, um, obviously we have hope to begin to engage with uh, family members, the family members of the students. So that is just one initiative, the Provo Scholars, that is having, I believe, a tremendous ripple effect. And of course, Dr. Gary could speak more about um, her dreams and goals and desires for that program, but that is one program that is going to have a tremendous impact in that city. And I'll just jump in there a little bit. And, and, you know, Kim, as a graduate of Shaw High School, you know, a lot of the graduates uh, do quite a bit to sort of help impact that community. Still, like, for example, uh, we do uh, school supply and, and uh, backpack drives at the beginning of the year, we do coat and boot drives as well. Um, and at times we go in and we do uh, well checks just to check if anybody wants to bring their, their kids down. And we do all of those kind of things because a healthy child is a child that can be educated and can learn. So a lot of the graduating classes of Shaw High School are taking on those sorts of uh, endeavors. And so if, you're looking for a class to join, come join the class of 85. We do a lot of work in that area. 
Thank you. Thank, thanks to all the panelists. Uh, I learned a lot today. I think it was a very good conversation. Um, and I really appreciate the fact that we talk about solutions, not only just saying the problem, that we really talk a lot about solutions. Um, I'd like to thank the attendees for your attention today, your time and questions. Uh, this has been truly amazing. And we want to continue to host events like this, the School of Nursing, where we learn to how better to be in our communities and ensure that all people have equitable access to services and opportunities. This wraps up our webinar. Thank you so much, all of you.